Cougar fans, it is time. Touchdown! What a grab! It's time to raise your colors, raise your voice, and join in on the raucous roundtable about your favorite team, the BYU Cougars. 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown! It's time to tailgate. <laughs> tailgate where BYU sports fandom lives. And here's your host, Lauren McClain. What's up, Cougar Nation? I'm Lauren McClain, and we're here to tailgate with you doing what we do best, talking all things BYU Cougars. Joining me today is BYU TV and BYU radio host, play-by-play and reporter Jason Shepard. Good to have you on, Shep. Always good to be on with you, Lauren. It has been a while since you've been on this particular show, but you've been busy with your own shows. Yeah, there's there's a lot going on, and uh, but that's why we do this, right? Keeps yes. us busy. It's what we love, and uh, I'm not going to complain at all. Absolutely. Let's get into it. BYU just wrapped up the first season in the Big 12. Results were mixed amongst the sports. Men's basketball found success in the transfer portal and outperformed all expectations but fell short in the postseason. Women's basketball, football, and both softball and baseball ran into the reality of the Big 12 that it's very competitive and will require a different level of recruiting. Jason has a unique point of view since he's the play-by-play radio voice of the BYU women's basketball team, radio studio host for football and men's basketball, calls BYU baseball and basketball on the radio, part of the TV broadcast for baseball and softball, and also often co-hosts BYU Sports Nation and is the host of the Deep Blue Podcast. Did I forget something? Uh, no, I think that's pretty good. <laughs> He's also I'm going to have you write my bio, too. That's pretty good. <laughs> that's a lot of stuff, Chef. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> So who better to discuss the successes and challenges of BYU's first year in a Power 5 conference with me than Jason Shepard? To start the show, we asked the fans, what was your favorite BYU sports moment in year one of the Big 12 conference? And this is what you said. Vaca Vidanek said, men's basketball at Kansas. Number two, men's basketball against Baylor, Texas, and Iowa State at home. And cross-country conference champions. And football, the Arkansas win and Texas Tech. Carter Vaughn on X said, men's basketball at Kansas. Nobody wins on the road in Allen Fieldhouse. BYU had low expectations going into the b-ball season. That win over Kansas encapsulated how special last season was for BYU hoops. So, Jason, what would you say was your number one moment or game from BYU's first year in the Big 12? It can be any sport. Yeah, to me, it's pretty easy. It's it's the win at Kansas. It's yeah. the win in Lawrence at Allen Fieldhouse and to add another layer to it, BYU was the only team that beat the Jayhawks on their home floor. I, I'm not. I don't care that it was viewed as maybe somewhat of a lesser Kansas team, or certainly one that struggled right. within the conference more than what we're used to seeing. But when you go into to Kansas and you can beat the Jayhawks on their home floor, that's that is massive, and it really elevated BYU basketball to another level because everybody was talking about it. And that was on Sports Center and it was just unbelievable. That step back three from Dallin Hall over Hunter Dickinson, that that's incredible. That was an I will never forget that play. That was awesome. So for me, hands down, that's the the best win and the biggest win for any sport in in the first year in the Big Twelve for BYU. Loved it. You have a handful of picks from men's basketball. It's got to be men's basketball. That yeah. was the biggest surprise for everybody. For me, it was the win against ranked Iowa State on January 20th because I feel like BYU's first home win in the Big 12, and it was a big one. Yeah. The Kansas game was probably the biggest overall, but that was the first win of the season where I was like, whoa, okay, okay, here we are. They can do this. They can make some waves in the Big 12. Start at the beginning of something beautiful for men's basketball last season. and So let's talk about men's basketball, possibly one of the most successful Cougar sports team year one of the Big 12, the one that definitely created the most buzz. They were picked to finish second to last in the conference, ended up finishing fifth in the Big 12, punched a ticket to the NCAA tournament. And then obviously everything that followed with Coach Pope leaving and then Kevin Young coming in and then his contract that was unprecedented, so obviously – Something happened, something special within men's basketball this year. What was your favorite part about this team, this men's hoops team this past season? The fact that it was completely unexpected. Yeah. Now, when I say unexpected, I mean unexpected from the outside. The right. players have said we knew we were going to be better than people thought. And players absolutely should go into every season with that mindset. And if you feel that where you're picked in the preseason, whether you believe in the preseason stuff or not – you absolutely use that as motivation. But I think what made this basketball season so much more enjoyable 
was the fact that it was a surprise and that this team exceeded most people's expectations. That's the way that you, you from the beginning of the season, when BYU started taking care of business against teams that they should beat, the, the win started coming. And then you start, you know, mixing in some tougher teams, and then you're still getting wins. You know, the, the win in the tournament around Thanksgiving over NC State, which ended up making yeah. a deep run in the yeah. NCAA tournament, you start adding wins like that. You had the early season win at home over ranked San Diego State, which was unbelievable. I actually, that was one of the conflict games between football and basketball. So, so I actually got to call that game mm. on the radio. So I was in courtside for that game. It was just the, it was electric in that building but you start building on that and then you go into conference and yeah you stumble out of the gate with the loss to Cincinnati but then you go to Baylor you play well and then you get on this hot streak yeah where you start winning some of these games in conference and it just made the season so exciting to watch not only were you excited that you're in the Big 12 but then you're having success in what everybody considers the best basketball conference in the country it was just an unbelievable year and one of the most enjoyable years of BYU basketball in recent memory it was just amazing to me it was incredible because from the outside it looked like it was just a bunch of kind of random guys thrown together you know what I'm saying like you come into the season you're like who are these guys and how are you how are these pieces going to fit together but obviously the coaches and the players knew something different than what we did I love they didn't shy away from the big moments they had lots of poise lots of maturity and it just was so exciting to watch. Do you think it was something like that? They just they had the right puzzle pieces with these different guys that just fit together. Was it a coaching thing? Was it a player thing? What do you think gave them the most success? Honestly, I think it was and I know this is somewhat of a cop out answer, but I think it was all of the above. I, yeah. I, I think it really was a group that bought into each other, but they also bought into this scheme that coach Pope and his coaching staff at the time had implemented for for what this team's strengths were. Yeah. They knew that they did not have a a post guy. Yeah. In, uh, because and I say that because we remember Foose ended up missing. Yeah, he was injured for missing several weeks. He missed I think five or six weeks of the season. And then you bring in Ali Khalifa, who was hurt at the time, and he was a revelation as that that point big man who essentially got the team into its offense, and his assist to turnover ratio was just through the roof. I I think it was a combination of the right people with the right scheme, and I love what they did to start the year in terms of the non-conference schedule, and and I, I, I hope they continue it, and it should be a blueprint moving forward. You do not need to over schedule yourself in the non-conference. Go out there and get the wins. Yep. Just and that's what this team did. It built itself up because it kept piling the wins against teams that they should beat. Then your your rankings, your metrics start to go up. So by the time then you actually beat a really really good team, you've you've made yourself high enough on the on the rankings that something like that can really catapult you into the conversation and that's what BYU did time and time again I I just think the way that everything was was laid out last year was it was really set up nicely for this team I agree and they weren't just winning they were winning convincingly right in that whole preseason on a scale from one to ten Shep where's your excitement level with the men hoops program under the leadership of Kevin Young uh, in this upcoming season it's a ten yeah I I am so excited and look, the program could have very easily gone the other direction. When you lose your head coach, yeah. you lose some very highly uh, touted recruits. Obviously, Colin Chandler was in the mix and then decided that he was going to flip his commitment to Kansas and now is officially signed with them. And so you, you could have very easily had all of that momentum come to a screeching halt. Not only did BYU not let that happen, they have built upon the momentum and are adding to it with the hire of Kevin Young, just a a slam dunk hire. The ability to bring in some really high-level transfers and really high-level high school recruits. And then maybe the, the biggest part of it all 
is retaining the guys that yeah. had options and that were a big part of your team, retaining them and keeping them on this roster. I, what BYU, the coaching staff, and everybody involved with BYU basketball has done since the departure of Mark Pope is is nothing short of brilliant. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, hats off, two thumbs up, however you want to say it. They have been amazing in making sure – that the momentum continues. And bringing Chris Burgess back, who's yes. known to be a phenomenal recruiter. Love Chris. Bringing some guys from Utah that, yeah. hey, we're not going yeah. to turn them away. Yeah. We're welcoming them all. Every move they've made has been to build off of the momentum and not, not let it go by the wayside. Do you think BYU making the tournament, finishing top five in the Big 12 getting big upset wins over historic programs. Is that something that's sustainable, or is that something that we're going to be like, man, 2023 was an epic season, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think it is sustainable. But look, there's a chance this year maybe BYU isn't the five seed. Maybe BYU's the sixth or seventh seed, but maybe they're better equipped to handle things in the postseason. You know what I mean? Maybe they're better equipped as a team to handle the conference tournament. And then if they get into the NCAA tournament, and look, if you're sixth or seventh in the Big 12, you're going to the NCAA tournament. Yeah. That's just the way it is. So I, I think that there there may be situations where you may be ranked lower in the conference, but yet your, your overall team dynamics actually will serve you better as the season goes on. But I, I think it's absolutely sustainable what BYU – has been able to do. And they, they're making the investment yes. in this program, and I love that. And, and fans, you can tell, love what they're seeing. That's That's been the most interesting part to me is how much BYU athletics and BYU in general is showing how much they care about yeah. men's basketball at this time, and I, I think it's incredible. On the women's side, which you know a lot about, Cougars finished 10th in the Big 12 this past season with a 16-17 and record, 6-12 and in conference play. Fell to Kansas in the Big 12 tournament and also ended their season against Santa Clara in the WBIT. Jason, they had that big win against number 18 Baylor. That was kind of the highlight of their season. But where did the women's hoops program fall short? I shouldn't say program, but where did they fall short this season that maybe they can improve on next year? Yeah, and I don't even know if I would consider it falling short. The the thing that this team dealt with this year was by the time the season started – it was a completely different team than what they had anticipated mm-hmm. having. They had some players that got injured in the offseason. They didn't have uh, Ari Mackey Williams, um, who is is now obviously healthy and is going to be back. So they were obviously planning on her. She's been in the program for for a couple of seasons now. She ended up, you know, tearing her ACL and missed. There were a couple of players that were supposed to be on the roster that ultimately did not make it um, to the program throughout the offseason. And so, you know, you were counting on them. You had Nani Falatea, who decided within, you know, a couple of games of coming back from an injury, decided she was going to enter the transfer portal. So you didn't have her. So the team that you thought you were going to have going into the year, you didn't have. And so everything was kind of done on the fly. The good thing, though, that happened was you were able to give more minutes to two highly touted freshmen in Amari Whiting and Kaylee Woolston, mm-hmm. and both played fantastic. Kaylee Woolston, from a shooting perspective, had one of the great freshman seasons and was one of the best in the country in terms of her shooting ability. Now, obviously, now she's going to step away from basketball because she's going on a mission. She was called to the uh, Baltimore. the Baltimore mission, so she and should be going um, uh, pretty soon. So you know, but you you were able to see these two really good freshmen come in and get playing time and yeah they had to go through their ups and downs but that will pay dividends for BYU um, you had somebody like Lauren Gustin who was the double double machine led the, the league again in not the league lead, led the nation the again nation. in rebounding so you had her that was sort of that constant and look I, this is based on we were talking about what the what the men have done on the women's side Coach Whiting and her staff have done a really good job of going into the transfer portal and trying to find players that fit their system well. And not only are they able to score, Coach Whiting, you got to play defense if you're yeah. going to play for Coach Whiting. You've got to play defense. 
And a lot of the players that are coming in, not only are they very athletic and can score, but they're also really good defenders. So I, I, I like the offseason so far for BYU women's basketball as well. Coming up, we talk BYU football in year two of the Big 12 and if our expectations are higher or lower than those nationally. This is Cougar Tailgate. Welcome back to Cougar Tailgate. I'm Lauren McLean with Jason Shepard here with me today. Football in 2023 had a roller coaster of a season, finishing 5-7, and seven, missing out on a bowl game, and finishing just 2-7 and seven in Big 12 play. Zero of those wins coming on the road. The only road win was at, uh, at Arkansas. They ended, up, uh, they ended their season with a five-game losing streak with a heartbreaker against Oklahoma State. Shep, what's the biggest area of improvement you want to see from this football team in 2024? Offensive line play. Okay. Yeah, that's that's where I go. And look, they've the the football team has has done things to try and rectify that. Obviously, they have a new offensive line coach that's going to come in with a new mentality and a new scheme. And by all accounts, the the players that that were here last year and that are back love what they're seeing with the changes. Obviously, they they continue to bring in guys for that offensive line, but you know that really was. It's not just offensive line play. Your offensive line play obviously controls your pass protection and whether or not your quarterback is under siege the entire game and certainly your your run game. And BYU really struggled to run the football mm-hmm. last year. And so I think with some changes that are being made on the offensive line, I think that will help the overall offensive production, whether it's the quarterback, and that's certainly something we can talk about because right now we don't even yeah. know who that quarterback is going to be. There are right. a lot of different options, but I also think it will significantly help the run game. And as we saw, especially in the Big 12, every one of BYU's opponents that they faced in the Big 12 all had that one running back that was just the guy. Right. And you knew it. You knew he was going to put up numbers, and and BYU needs to find that because everybody else in the conference had that guy that was just just a stud running back that carried the load. And I'm I'm curious to see where BYU goes to find their guy. Yeah, we saw some some flashes of brilliance from Aiden Robbins towards the end of the season. L.J. Martin, who's dealing with some injuries now, so it's gonna yeah. it's kind of a mystery, right? Yeah, the run game really did kill BYU and you saw that uh yeah the defensive backs in the Big 12 they're not yeah if you can't run the ball yeah you can't throw the ball either right those right. receivers because, yeah, didn't because have then they know room. they don't have to cover the run yes the receivers didn't have any room at all so i would have loved to see honestly what Keaton Slovis could have done with a good run game he might have had a completely different career here at BYU he would have a lot less running for his life right <laughs> <laughs> right Shep, on a scale from 1 to 10 how much faith do you have speaking of in that quarterback room at the moment right now with kind of led by Jake Retzlaff. Yeah, I mean, I, I have I have faith in Coach Roderick and Fessy Satake that they're going to find the right guy. And you have guys, you mentioned Jake Retzlaff, who was able to get four starts last year. Gary Bohannon has come in, and we know what his pedigree is, but he's he's coming in, and we actually, I did an interview with him on the Deep Blue podcast. I, I th- really enjoyed getting to talk to him and he talked about how he is relishing the opportunity to come in and show that he's still that guy Mm. and I I like that attitude we certainly know what his skill set is so I like the options that BYU has it's going to be which of these guys can sort of take the reins but I, I do like the talent that's in there. And to go back to the point about the offensive line, if your offensive line play can get better yeah. and maybe even significantly get better, th- that's going to make whoever the quarterback is look a lot better, and the right. numbers should follow with that. Do you believe that BYU can compete with the big dogs in the Big 12 year in and year out after what you saw in 2023? I think football still has some room to improve in terms of being that team that that can be in the mix every But look, that that shouldn't surprise anybody and that's not a negative thing. Football especially, you always knew or at least if you were being honest, yeah. you knew it was going to take some time. Right. Look, and 
you know me. I hate to use Utah as an example for anything. <laughs> but they went through this, too, when they went from the Mountain West to the Pac-12. It took them a couple of seasons to figure out how it worked. Right. To figure how out. How do we recruit? How do we recruit? How do we compete? What type of yeah. players do we need yes. to compete? It just takes some time, and that's okay. That's, that's part of it. You go through those growing pains, and that's what BYU football is going through right now. Now, Vegas has BYU's win total for next year at four and a half. Yeah. I think BYU is certainly going to win more than four games. Now, I can't tell you which ones because just from week to week in this conference, you just don't know. But I, I believe that this team will show enough improvement that they're going to have more than four wins. I, I I don't know where they're going to end up, but it's it's okay for this team to realize and for fans to realize that it's okay for it to take some time. I know we all want it immediately, but you just can't assume that you're going to go into this next level college football and it's it's just going to be just a breeze. You right. you got you've got to figure some things out along the way. Everybody that goes through this has to deal with this, and BYU's dealing with that right now. Fans just thought, we had 10 years of independence. Yeah. Why has this not you know, prepared us for the Big 12? I guess there is some point there, but I, until you're actually in it, mm-hmm. you still don't know. Yeah. Playing a couple of, of big teams per year doesn't necessarily pre- prepare you for the grind of game in yep. and game in out, week in and week out. Four new schools joining this competitive league with Utah – Arizona, Arizona State, and Colorado. What do you think BYU is going to be facing in that regard in 2024? Uh, well, you, what do you mean in terms of just, competition. just having more? Do you, think, do you think having those four is going to elevate the the football competition? Oklahoma, oh, yeah. Texas out, those four in. Yeah. Is this going to be harder for BYU football this year, or is it going to be the same since – I guess you could put Utah kind of on the same – level as Oklahoma and Texas, at least in football, they have been doing a really, really good job. But the other three teams, I don't know. So competitively, how do you think it's going to be? Yeah, I mean, I I would expect it to be about the same. I think when you lose a program like Texas and and Oklahoma, who obviously BYU faced both of those teams last year in football, you you can't lose two teams like that and, and maybe overall say that you're better but is a conference in terms of talent, but obviously we, we know how good Utah is and what and I, I think clearly of the four schools coming in, they're the best of the four. Um, and so Arizona State is is one of those teams that is trying to figure they they've got they've got other issues that right. they're dealing with. <laughs> they're trying to figure it out. Arizona had an unbelievable year last year, but they lost their head coach. Yeah. Can they keep the momentum that they had last year, and they were really, really good last year. Can can they keep up with what they did? And Colorado is Colorado is so interesting because of the Dion factors. Coach Prime, excuse me. Yes. Um, obviously, an unbelievable start. Put some respect behind yeah. the name. And then and then faltered towards the end. And what do they do in year two? I I certainly lo- like the competition that that it will add, but. I, I don't know if I say that it's significantly better, significantly worse. Yeah. I, I think I think it probably would be about the same. There, there's not going to be any off weeks this year, right? And, and quite frankly, probably any year. There's going to be drama. There's going to be intrigue. Yeah, absolutely. This is, and that's exactly what the commissioner of the Big Twelve wants. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, he knows. does. It's totally yeah. what he wants. I I think. Tell me if you agree or disagree here. One thing that Bronco Mendenhall taught me was that you can have good talent on your roster, maybe not the most elite in the country, but if you have discipline Mm -hmm. on your team in both the offensive on all facets, right? You can, you can compete at a high level and you can beat almost anybody. What I would like to see is a little more discipline on the offensive side of the ball. I feel like Jay Hill bringing Jay Hill has been extremely refreshing on the defensive side. He does kind of bring in a little bit of that Bronco esque discipline on the defensive side of the ball and I, I feel like it'd be nice to see that on the offensive side just a tad more this season. And you can compete. I, I think 
I think that will elevate if we can see a little bit more of that. So only time will tell, right? Let's go to the baseball and softball side of things, Shep. Softball finished sixth in the conference, beat Oklahoma State in the conference tournament, then lost to Oklahoma. Baseball finished last in the conference with a 21-31 record, but just 7-23 and in Big 12 play. Baseball didn't qualify to make the Big 12 tournament this season. But what is needed to elevate the talent on the BYU baseball team and win a few more games next season? I think, I think health is a big thing for baseball. I think just overall, just increasing the talent level, and and then see what and then see what you got. But this this is a very tough baseball league, and unfortunately for BYU in its first season, they 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 just dealt with a lot of injuries, mm. and then the losses kind of started to pile up, and and they just didn't end up the way that they had wanted in year one. But we know that this baseball program has a history, a really good history of of winning. And it's going to take some time to kind of ramp everything up, but th- this is they can get the guys in here that can help. I'm I'm excited about what the next couple of years can be with BYU baseball. Overall, Shep, my last question for you is was year one in the Big Twelve a success for BYU athletics? Okay, I'm gonna answer this maybe a little differently than somebody else would. To me, yes, it is a success. And the biggest reason why, it's because you're in it. Yeah. You made it. Yeah. And and I and by, when We're I say there. Yeah, when I say you made it, I don't mean it's your finished product, but getting into this league or a P five league, that was such a major hurdle. And I don't want to say that you're just happy to be there. But year one, there's probably a little of that there. That, oh my gosh, we finally got, we finally are part of the club. We right. we're we're part of the big boys, and so for me, just being in here, regardless of how things went, it was going to be a success. Individually, you know, there's obviously varying degrees of that success, but I I can't look back on this year and think anything other then it was a positive experience and and excited for all of these programs to build on it moving into year two and then into the future. Absolutely. I 100% agree with you. All right, that does it for us today. Thanks again to Jason Shepard for coming on the show with me. Carter Braun and Tori Kimball helped produce this episode with senior producer Terry South. You can join the Cougar Tailgate wherever you get your podcasts, on Apple, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, or on BYURadio.org. Cougar Tailgate is a production of BYU Radio.